Today's reading is from John 14, 20 to 21. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be my loved by my Father, and I too will love them. Chung Sung Gyeong, Book 7, Chapter 2. It is written in the Bible that the kingdom of God is within you. This means the kingdom of heaven is a place that is in oneness with God's love. And that love should be in your heart. You are in me and I am in you, are also not an abstraction. These words are possible when they are rooted in love. Fallen human beings are finding their way toward that day in which God's love can be manifested through their body and mind. The explosive love of God will shine forth. It is so wonderful that your cells will tingle. You will feel all your bones and flesh harmonize and bond together. Adieu. Now anyway, this year the football players had, had some protests going on and uh, it didn't go well, created a lot of controversy. Nobody wanted to uh, watch a football game and discuss politics. How about work and politics? Is that a good mix? Usually not. Don't, don't start talking politics with your buddies. Well, how about uh, church and politics? Is that a good mix? Yeah, don't bring it up now, right? How about your marriage and politics? No. Yeah, politics doesn't seem to go well with anything. But what are politics? What does the word mean? I got, here, I got me a dictionary. I had to look this stuff up. Do you, do you young people know what this is? It's a dictionary. All right. Anyway, the word politics means the art or science of government. All right, let's look up government. Government means authoritative direction or controls. So why do governments exist? What is the purpose of governments? Mostly governments exist when there's lots of people to organize lots of people. In America, we have a kind of unique idea where the Declaration of Independence stated that governments are instituted to secure the happiness of the governed, the people that are, that are governed, that's us. But that's a rather unique concept. But I think overall, governments should exist for the benefit of the people. So if, if governments exist for the benefit of the people, why, is this, why do they generate so much controversy, so much uh, ill will, so many, so, many, so many feelings? And of course, it's not just here in America. All over the world, governments are, are having trouble. Many countries are engaged in civil war all the time. Many countries are ruled by uh, coalitions of minority representatives because there is, no, there is no majority consensus in the country. So politics is, is, is not having a good day usually. So what, what are governments good at? Governments are good at collecting taxes, but do they secure the fair and equitable distribution of wealth for the people? They're good at getting your money, they're not good at giving you money, right? Governments are good at writing laws telling you what you can do and when you can or can't do it, but are they good at unleashing the potential of people to, to excel? They don't do that either. Governments are good at, at fighting wars, but are governments good at securing peace and prosperity? They're kind of opposite each other. <clears throat> That's why there's so much controversy in government. And no matter how you look at it, whether the Democrats win or Republicans win or the independents win, any way you look at it, you lose. Because the governments do not, governments are not equipped to solve the problems of human beings. All human, all human problems come from one place. Is there enough food on the planet Earth? Did God make enough food for people to eat? Did God make enough water for people to drink? Do you have enough air to breathe? Is everybody okay with the air? 
What is the source of our problems then? <laughs> Management. All human problems come from relationships. All human problems are relationship problems. <clears throat> the world, governments do not solve relationship problems. Governments are not equipped to solve relationships between people because governments are composed of people who have the same relationship problems as the people they govern. In the, in the, in the, um, in the book, in the, first, in the first book of Samuel in the Bible, the Jewish people asked, they wanted a king. They wanted a king. And God told them, don't get no king. He said, I brought Israel out of Egypt and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But now you have rejected your God who saves you out of all your calamities and distress. And you have said, no, set a king over us. Same thing today. God has done a better job of saving us from our calamities and our distresses than governments can do. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. Is God good? Now, are God's relationships good? Does anybody here like God? Does God like anybody here? If God likes you, raise your hand. Mostly people think God likes me. So God is good at relationships. In the Bible it says, however, that God created human beings in his own image. So we should be a reflection of God. We should be good at relationships. But the truth is, human history is so full of bad relationships, so much mistreatment among people, so many bad things being done to each other, that most people have, 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 don't believe that human beings can be like God. I would probably say that everybody doesn't believe human beings can be like God, with one exception, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Jesus 100% believed that we should be like God. Matthew 5:48 couldn't be any clearer. You should be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus didn't say you should be forgiven for being an idiot. He said you should be perfect. <clears throat> if you read the Beatitudes, um, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Those are just like a primer on how to relate to other people. How to relate to other people. Be humble, be meek. Be righteous. Jesus Christ, when his, in his day, he revolutionized relationships. The world he came to, the Jewish nation he came to, followed the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus Christ didn't say like that. He said, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye, and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Completely revolutionizing thinking, normal thinking. But if you think about it, and I've thought about it, if you do an eye for eye and tooth for tooth, that's like, that's like having a war. And in a war, you can defeat your enemy, but you can never win a war. You do not win wars. You defeat enemies, but you don't win anything. The enemy is still your enemy. There's no winning. But when you turn your cheek, when you're humble, when you're meek, when you, when you bring people together, 
you have a win. It's dip. Jesus was teaching great wisdom. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Have you been praying for me, Ellie? Probably. Jesus really loved God. Jesus really loved God. Jesus thought about God a lot. We are always struck by Jesus' continual connection with God. When he talked to people, he talked about God. And we, and we realize it. Right? All the parables that you read in the Bible, Jesus' words always connect to God. Somebody asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Trying to, to trap him. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. Jesus' constant connection to God is amazing, and that's what strikes us about Jesus. In fact, Jesus was so connected to God, he would go to the cross and die for him when God said, that's what you got to do. <clears throat> that was, that, and, that con and that connection, that connection between Jesus and God is why when Jesus says, God is in me, it is not abstract. It's not an abstract God. It's not an abstract statement. It's a very clear statement because love is binding them together. Love is, what is love, by the way? We've done this before. What's the, what's the definition of love? It's very important to have a clear definition of love because you got to know what you're trying to do. What is love? Ooh, ooh. Thank you, but sorry, not enough. For, what did Reverend Moon say? Love is the power that, the power between two to unite them. Love is the power between two to bring them together. Love is the force that brings two people or two things, you and your motorcycle, you and your money, whatever, brings it together. That's what love is. With this understanding of love, that shows us the definite, that's, that's the force connecting Jesus and God. The force that makes him the two is love, is, makes them one is love. So Jesus can say, I am in the Father, and don't you know, don't, don't, what, what I say is what God says. <clears throat> In exactly the same way, that same love can connect us to Jesus. That's why Father said in the Hundake, the words, you are in me and I am in you, are not an abstraction. It's not a generic, good feeling thing. The words you are in me and I am in you means to become one. I become like Jesus, and Jesus should become something like me somehow. But anyway. <clears throat> so when I love Jesus, when love unites me with Jesus, we become one. So then imagine that I have all the qualities of Jesus. When I become one with Jesus, I should have his qualities. I love my enemies. I pray for those who persecute me. I do not store up treasure here on earth, but store up my treasure in heaven. I do not worry about my life, what I will drink, or what I will wear. I am the one who seeks God's, God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And then all the good things God will give to me. I am checking the log in my own eye before I check the speck in my neighbor's eye. That would be a revolution in my life. Don't you think so? <clears throat> would I be a better person if I was like that? Somebody should say no, that I'm already good enough, but I got no, I got no love out here. And of course, but we're doing those things 
is that easy? Is it easy to do those things? Is it easy to love your enemy? I mean, that's just like ultra Reverend Moon, ultra Jesus. Is it easy to love your enemy? No. Is it easy to love the jerk driving next to you on the highway? No. Is it easy to pray for people who persecute you, who vote? Forget about it. No, it's not easy. It's not easy to, to be all the things that Jesus said to be. It's not easy. But if I love Jesus, it would be a lot easier. If I love Jesus, to do the things he said to do would be a lot easier because I would be connected in heart and one. In the early days of Christianity, um, just a point that, because Christian history is full of persecution, full of people suffering for their faith. In the early days of Christianity, the, uh, the Christians were persecuted horribly in Rome. They were fed to the lions. They were massacred in the arena. They were burned at the stake. But, they, but the burning love that was, that was ex being experienced in those early days, the burning love between the Christians and Jesus, and Jesus and the Christians was igniting people, inspiring people. So there were reports of incredible things. One report I can't forget is that when they were burning some Christians in the Colosseum, they were burning them at the stake, and it must have been more than one, they started singing holy songs, started singing hymns. So then some of the spectators that were watching them get burned, they got inspired and they jumped out of the seats and they ran and threw themselves into the fire too to be burned with the Christians. This is, amazing things can happen with love. <clears throat> if you consider, if I become one with Jesus, now you guys know this, would I, do you think I would be easier to work with if I was just like Jesus? Would I be easier to work with who wants a boss who sees the log in his own eye before he comes to check out the speck in your eye? Nobody? I guess all you guys are bosses. Sorry. What about, uh, what about you sisters here? If I was like Jesus, would I be a better, would I be a better husband if instead of... Uh, if, 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 if instead of arguing with my wife, I prayed for her when she persecutes me. Would I be a better husband if instead of storing up my treasure in heaven, I let her spend all the money? <laughs> Who does that already? I already do. Believe me. That's a revolution in relationships. But that's a great way to relate to somebody. <clears throat> somebody said that would be the ideal husband. And everybody wants to live with an ideal husband. <clears throat> so we have to change our bad relationships where, where, where nobody can see God to good relationships where, where, which are the image of God. And can we do that? Jesus said, you should, Jesus said you could do it. He ain't the only one, though. In 1973, Reverend Moon proclaimed, life in union with God is the one great way to live. Life with God, life in God, and God living in you. The one great way to live. But Reverend Moon didn't just proclaim it. He lived it himself. There's no abstraction between Reverend Moon and God. When I, I've seen Reverend Moon many times, and when he spoke of God, he spoke of God with intimacy. Intimacy. He talked about God's suffering. He knew how God was suffering. And he knew what made God happy. And he knew what made God sad. 
He had an intimate relation with God. I mean, he talked about God. He talked about a God that was immediate. When everyone talked about God, there was a sense of immediacy. That God is here. This is where God is. There was a sense of a, a concreteness of God when everyone talked about God. There's a concreteness there that you could feel God's presence. He talked about God with conviction. I never thought of faith with Reverend Moon. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. But there was no hope. Who, who hopes for what he already has, St. Paul said. If you have it, you don't hope for it. So there was no hope for, for God's presence and God's, God's connection to Reverend Moon. He didn't, he, he, it was concrete. He was not unseen. It was evident in all the, everywhere he went, everything he, everywhere, no matter what his situation, it was evident to him that God was with, with him. And Reverend Moon's conviction made me convinced, convicted me that there could be a God even in the miserable world that I grew up in, the world of terrible relationships. Of course, some of the worst relationships are no relationship at all, like when your father leaves the family, or when you never have a father at all. Some of the worst relationships are no relationship. But in, the, in that bad world, Reverend Moon convinced me that there could be a God, because he was convinced. And when he when, and and when I thought of, when I when I saw his intimacy with God, I want to be intimate with God. Do you want to be intimate with God? I mean, do you want to be tight with God? For you people who don't understand that word, you want to be tight with God. Do you want to feel that God is right here in your life? I want to be convicted of God, convicted that is that is real. Sometimes things don't go the way they should go. If I have conviction that God is with me, I can still go, and the results can be, can be good. So, if I want to get Reverend Moon's conviction, his intimacy, his uh, immediacy of relation with God, what do I have to do? I have to become one with Reverend Moon. How do we become one? How do two become one? The force of love unites us. Then our relationship is not an abstraction. And if Reverend Moon is convicted that God exists, convinced that God exists, intimate with God, uh, immediately re re uh, referencing God, then I am also convicted of God's existence. Convinced that God exists, intimate with God, and uh, immediate with God. Does that make my life better? We want to revolutionize relationships. We have to revolutionize relationships. I have to, if I want to revolutionize relationships in this world, I have to love the true parents. For you two, that's Reverend Moon. <clears throat> Father's words become my words. My words become Father's words. So I want to read some of Father's words. God set the pattern for the universe. In the ideal existence, we live for others. God's definition of goodness is total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness. We are to live for others. God lives for man, and man lives for God. The husband lives for the wife, and the wife lives for the husband. Here, unity, harmony, and prosperity abound. This is the very reason for our existence. We exist for others, for an object, for a counterpart. How's, how does uh, taking care of number one compare to that? Not too good. 
This is the principle for all human relationships in our society. Parents exist for children. Children exist for parents. Then, both parents and children, when they give unselfishly, become united in circular motion. <clears throat> this circling motion is the motion of unity. The sun is round, the moon, the earth, and all heavenly bodies are round. Everything in the universe has complementary give and take action between subject and object. That's our revolutionary statement. We exist, the reason we exist is for the sake of others. The reason you are here is for the sake of others. Is this my idea? Is this Reverend Moon's idea? This is God's idea. Everything in the universe is actually built on a complementary relationship. God ex set the pattern for existence, and it exists everywhere, except in human relationships, of course. So why are, why are our relationships bad? Let's ask God. Let's ask Reverend Moon. Evil. <clears throat> Evil is the emergence of selfishness into this world. God's principle of unselfish giving was twisted into an ungodly principle of selfish taking. We have not known total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness in our world, and we suffer for it. We suffer for it. That's why we suffer. Look all over the world. I see people using identity politics to create drama and to not solve problems. Always promoting diversity and separation. And it's all over the world. In northern Spain, there's a, a group of people, uh, a large section of northern Spain that doesn't like being part of Spain anymore. They feel oppressed. They feel historically misused by the main body of Spain. And they want to separate, make their own little nation. The Kurds, the Kurds in Syria, they're a big problem for the Syrians, along with everybody else, but the Kurds are a long-standing problem because they, they feel oppressed by the Muslim majority of the, of, the, of the Syrians. They've been persecuted for not being Muslim. They've been oppressed, they've been taken advantage of, and they want to separate. They want their own area, their own independent area. And it's like this in many places in the world, right? Every, in many places in the world, people are looking for their own separate place. Will separation, will taking care of myself, will taking care of my people, will that make the world a better place? Absolutely not. Total giving, total service, absolute unselfishness will make the world a better place. If these people are successful in creating their own little nations, what will happen? It's guaranteed. They will have little nations that are, that are going to become impoverished in 20 years. The smaller the economy, the less money. The young people will move out of these little nations and go to America or go to Portugal or go someplace else that they make more money. These little places will become horrible places to live in 20 years. I guarantee it. Because separation and division do not create prosperity. Where do we get peace and harmony and prosperity? Unity. Unification, unity, getting together creates harmony and prosperity. So, <clears throat> total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness will make the world a better place. Living for the sake of others will make the world a better place. I guarantee it. God guarantees it. Have you ever heard anybody uh, talk like that in a political campaign? In any country? Never happens. So why do politicians never get anything done, really, realistically speaking? Because they're not equipped to repair human relationships. They're not equipped to, to, to do this. <clears throat> 
We have not known total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness between races. And so we see struggling between races. America, there's a long history of, uh, <clears throat> of bad relations between black and white. And there's also a long history now of uh, laws uh, passed to, to, to mitigate the situation and make things better. Have, have laws been able to make things better? Martin Luther King hoped for the day when a man could be judged by the content of his character, not by the color of his skin, not by the diversity. But true equality will never be realized by law, under law. True equality will be possible only when we relate to each other with total service, total giving, and absolute unselfishness. When both sides are practicing total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness. And when that happens, I will not be a white man, or a black man, or a yellow man. I will be a man. And there will be no more identity politics. We will all be just a man when we totally live for the sake of the other person. When that happens, when I don't think of myself as a white man, or a black man, or a yellow man, and, that, and the woman don't think of herself as a black woman or a white woman, what will happen? Tiger Woods, Derek Jeter, they have biracial parents. They're great leading athletes, great performers, showing us how the great, the great um, potential of biracial couples. Satan's world has been the world of division, separation, and diversity. There are people out there celebrating diversity. Diversity will not make people happy. God's world will be the world of diversity and unity and harmony. Two will become one through total giving, total service, absolute unselfishness. That's the great beauty of life. <clears throat> we haven't known total service, total giving, and absolute unselfishness between races, so our races struggle. We haven't known total service, total giving, absolute unselfishness between religions, so religions struggle. We haven't known total service, total giving, absolute unselfishness between nations, so nations struggle. There is only one solution, God's solution. So you want to keep on living in this miserable world, or do you want to start revolutionizing rev relationships, building a better world? Who wants to revolutionize relationships? Thank you. Thank you. So let's revolutionize relationships. Let's study the revolution of relationships. You can read Father's words just to get an idea where we have to go. <clears throat> True love is not about being served, but serving others. When God created his object partner of love in the beginning, he invested all of his energy, all of himself, 100%. In this way, God set the example of true love. In other words, God set the tradition of true love by exhausting himself completely. This true love is the center of the cosmos. <clears throat> That's the example of true love God set. Invest 100%. That's what Father taught us. Invest in who 100%? Invest in your wife 100%. Invest in the people you work with, 100%. Invest, invest. What does investment mean? You give. Who gets paid first with investment? The guy you're giving to or you? 
The guy you give to gets first. It's an investment. But investment is about return. But you make the investment, then you get the return. Father always said things so simple to understand. But God invested himself 100%. So I got to invest myself 100%. Love is total investment. A man looking for love needs to invest everything. He has to invest his five senses completely. His eyes, his ears, his nose, his mouth, and sense of touch. <clears throat> Unless he fits with the perfect shape of the model, according to the original form of creation, he does not qualify to attain his love. Resembling God, <clears throat> he must invest everything. Where does true love begin? It is not from you. It begins from God. <clears throat> God is the origin of love. He created this world because he needed his ideal partner in love. Accordingly, even the creation of heaven and earth had its origin in love. Love is possible only in a world of reciprocity. Reciprocity? Well, re that's my bad pronunciation anyway. Re reciprocal, back and forth, give and take. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What kind of love is true love? The original nature of true love is not to focus on first receiving for your own sake, but on giving first for the sake of others and for the whole. True love is a love that gives without remembering having given and continues to give. It is love that gives happily. A mother feels love and joy in her heart while nursing her baby because she's giving from herself. A filial son feels joy while making sacrifices for his parents of love, out of love. Don't, Father, put things so simply all the time. Give and don't remember that you gave. Don't count what you gave. I can always think about what Father said and check myself, how am I doing? But, you know, that's rough, right? That's not easy. Give without thinking about, just give, forget that you gave. That's, that kind of relationship with somebody will win somebody's heart. That would win anybody's heart. But it's not easy to do, is it? No. Who likes it? Real love is not giving and keeping account of how much was given. It is not self-serving. Real love exists for the sake of others. After having loved someone, can you say, the reason I loved you was so I could be happy? You must not go there. The person who feels inadequate after having loved, the person who feels many things even beyond inadequacy, is in accord with the principle of ideal love. But the person who says, now that I have loved you, you have to love me, is not in accord with this principle. Mm. Wow, anyway, like I said, it ain't easy. But we're doing our best, right? Because, because Father told us we know what to do. We're doing our best. We're gonna revolutionize our relationships. But think about it. What would the world be like if everybody thought like that? No. What would the world be like if everybody felt that to the bone? Like true parents feel it to the bone. That, that the purpose I exist is for the sake of the other person, for the benefit of the other person. <clears throat> All the problems of the world are problems of relationship. What kind of relationships would we have if we felt to the bone that I, I exist for the benefit of the other person? What kind of relationships would there be between races if they felt to the bone that they exist for the sake of the other race? 
no matter what the history has been, if people felt I exist for the benefit of the other people, what kind of relationship would we have? What kind of relationship would we have between nations if the nations felt I exist for the benefit of that nation? If America felt I have to do something to help the Philippines, what would the relationship between the Philippines and America be like? If we, if we gave without asking anything in return, just gave to help, asking nothing, and the Filipinos came back, we want to give you something. They would want to, because they would feel so. If we felt that to the bone. So how do we get to feel that to the bone, like true parents feel it to the bone? We have to love the true parents. Because love is a force that unites two into one. And when true parents feel to the bone that we live for the sake of others, that we live for the sake of the other nation, then we, if we are one in heart, we will feel the, we'll feel the same thing. That'll be our normal feeling. We let, our, we, let our, we, we let ourselves get into true parents, and we let true parents get into us. <clears throat> then it would be like God's words are being spoken through true parents, and God's words are being spoken through me. And when I speak, I speak God's words. That's just because that's just normal. That's just, that's just who I am. So think about, pick up the books, read the words of true parents, know the true parents, let the true parents come into you. Then the words you speak will be God's words, will be true parents' words. You have to read, we read the book, we read the words. Father, Father talked about electric love of God, electric explosive love of God, every cell in my body tingling. Do you want to feel every cell in your body tingling in love? Do you want to have an electric spark when you touch your wife? Especially on her skin? Do you want to have that electric spark when you look at each other? Who doesn't? That love of God is not an abstraction. Being one with God is not an abstraction now. We can become one with God. We can become one with God. It's not abstract, it's concrete, it's real. If we love true parents. So then, you will be at the center of the relationship revolution. The revolution from selfishness to unselfishness. You will be the host or the hostess of the future. You will bring in the new age. You will be remembered. You will not only talk about your ideal husband or your ideal wife. You will live with your ideal husband or your ideal wife. Because you will be an ideal husband or an ideal wife. So do you want to experience the ecstasy and victory of a relationship of total giving, total service, and absolute unselfishness? Yes. I do too. God bless you. Thank you.